Good morning, good morning. Welcome to another episode of Sunday Morning Transplant Coffee Talk. I am your host, Steve Belcher. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Man, it is a scorcher out there. I just stepped outside a few minutes ago, and I mean, it was just like stepping into an oven. I'm not sure exactly the temp, but I know yesterday it was 103. Man, let me tell you, if you're a kidney warrior and you're out in this heat, you have to be out. Um, you got to balance your hydration because you know you can't drink a lot of fluid if you're subjected to fluid overload. And then you don't want to under drink because the possibility of being dehydrated. So this is where you really have to be mindful and your fluid your fluid balance. So please uh, watch your fluid hydration, stay hydrated, but at the same time, uh, be mindful of what and how much you're taking in. So today I have a great guest. You all know her from the Lisa Baxter show that comes on 8 p.m. every Sunday right here on Urban Health Outreach Media. She's a transplant recipient. She's an author, an actor, um, social worker, kidney advocate, and um, post-dialysis uh, patient, been on, as she say, for 12 years. It could have been more, could have been less. I'll let her tell you. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on Lisa Baxter. Hey, Lisa, what's going on? Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve. <laughs> How y'all doing out there? I don't know about you, but in New York, I'm cooking like a bird. Woo! Really? I, what? You don't have any AC where you're at? Don't go there. I was a good Samaritan and gave my AC away a couple of years ago, donated it, and... um. Where I had lived at the time was, you know, it was the air was great. I mean, you can open a window. I mean, it was beautiful all the time. And where I moved now was just a scorcher. It's just a scorcher. And I'm working on getting a, a, another um, another air conditioner. You know, out there, there's free air conditions out there. So, you know, if you um anywhere by United Way or Salvation Army, you can get a free air conditioner if you have a, a, a you know, a disability. Or right. any, you know, respiratory and stuff like that. You know, they put it in for you and everything. Or pay the cost because you couldn't pay your um, um, Con Ed bill or air condition bill, you know, your electric bill. They will um, also pay. So you got a lot of them out there, not just those three. No, I understand but, that. Know. But right now, you don't have any AC where you're at right now. No. So if you see me sweating or look like somebody threw a bucket of water, you know why. So, wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, do you have access to go to a cooling spot or be in AC if you needed to do that? Well, yeah, I would either go, you know, by a family member or I mean, even a landlord doesn't uh, have an AC, but they have some kind of ceiling fans and something. It feels a little cooler downstairs than it does up here. So either I'll be down there or in every transportation I'm in, have something, you know, have air conditioning, you know, every car or bus when I'm riding, it, you know, I mean, accessorize because I ride accessorize. Right. So but how you I'm, make it overnight and sleeping? Well, I got a fan. I got one window fan and I got a regular fan, you know. So between that and, and showers and splashings of waters and all of that. Wow. So far, so good. OK, but, OK. So I'm trying not to ever put myself this way again. I don't know what made what this, you know, I'm working on this situation now. But sure. it's, it's, yeah, so That's I'm still alive and kicking. <laughs> OK, so Lisa, let's um, go back to the start of when you found out you had kidney disease. How I know you self, you had PKD, which is polycystic kidney disease. Yes. Um, when. Did you learn you had that and how serious it was? Mm. Uh, well, um, I was engaged to Mitchell Baxter. I had to, uh, I, you know, my job had us going for physicals every year. So I've always went. 
But this time when I was getting married, I had a blood test and what have you. And uh, they noticed something in the blood and the urine. So they had me go for a sonogram. And the sonogram showed that I had polycystic kidney disease, but they didn't tell me at the time. You know, while I'm on the table, I hear them whispering and talking, you know, to the text, but they couldn't say anything to me. I kept saying, is there anything wrong? Or uh, can, you know, let me know something. And said, oh, your doctor going to talk to you. I said, well, why can't you talk to me? They said, no, we can't talk to you. Your doctor have to talk to you. So I knew something was wrong then, but I was praying a whole lot that it, it wasn't anything. And maybe like two weeks later, I got a letter in the mail. And at the time, I read it to my my fiance, which was Mitchell Baxter at the time. And I still didn't know what it mean. And I told him that I said, listen, this thing says I have polycystic kidney disease. And at that time, I wasn't one that studied it like I do now or understood it like I do now or know how to live it like I do now. So, you know, that's why I tell the story, because a lot of warriors will not you know, dig into anything or just wave it away or something like that. I just knew I had it. They didn't say what to do with it or how do you live with it or anything like that. So, you know, once I told it to him, I told him, look, if you don't want to marry me or get married, I'd understand because what in the world is polycystic kidney disease? It doesn't sound like a fun thing, you know. So he says, listen, baby, I believe God. Now, I knew I believed God, but I had to hear him say it because he's a man. You know, women... We know when we want to get married and we, we sure. But, you know, sometimes um, it can scare a man or shake a man up. Not saying it couldn't shake a woman up, but I just didn't want him to have to run or be scared after he saw it. But he, mm -hmm. he, he stayed in it for the long haul, you know, of the 23 years of our marriage. And uh, we both walked in healthy people and both had to deal with illness. So, you know. Right. Well, let me ask you this. So you mentioned in a lot of your posts and I believe in your book that your family has polycystic kidney disease. Now, did you know that before you got married that your family dealt with this disease? Yeah. Uh, my father is the one that had polycystic kidney disease. I believe they found out when he was in the army because he was in the army a lot of years. But they didn't kick him out for that. You know, they kick you out now for that. If you say you have it, they put you out right away, give you a letter, shake your hand, pow. Sure. You know, so... That's understandable because that's how one of my relatives got out. You know, his mother told me. No, no, got no out. right. But you I'm know? saying, did you did you know that you were at risk since you knew your father had it? Did you know that it was a possibility that you would get it or you was oblivious to all that? I was oblivious, but I, I was one of them faith, deep faith people from childhood. You know, if God said I wasn't going to get it, I wasn't going to get it. Who knew he could use that as a testimony? I didn't see that when I first got it because I had to question him when I when when they were wheeling me in to give me the fistula and everything. I was questioning God all the way to the operating room. So don't get me started. But I, I didn't know. I didn't know because when my, my father had it, all I know is he had it. They ain't say we could get it. All they said is that he had it. And we still didn't know what it was then. Then my brother Mark was on dialysis. He had it. He was the one who told us we needed to get checked out. So that's why we started getting checked out. You know, we didn't want to at first because he kept saying it and pushing the envelope with it. And we were like, why he keep saying that? And we ended up eventually finding out, you know, one after the other had it. But there were different times in different years because, you know. But was that before you found out? when you went to get that, when you got that letter or was it after the letter? Well, I just, like I said, all I knew was my father had it. I didn't know anything about the disease or if that we can get it. All they said is he had it. And that's all we went with. Now, when Mark got it, we figured, oh, poor Mark. Poor Mark got this thing. You know, you don't got it. You know, we didn't see no symptoms. We didn't even know what the symptoms was. But th that's how you feel sometimes. Even when my sister Yolanda kept saying, um, Telling me and my sister giving us papers, you know, they had little newspapers. We didn't want to see the paper. You know, we said, OK, we're going to read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, this is what made me, do, uh, you know, us be passionate about what we do, because I was one of those people that went to a quack doctor or didn't never tell my history of the family and stuff like that, because I didn't know how important that was. So that's why I, you know, sometimes you hear me say the same story a hundred times to so somebody out there, get it. You got to say the family history. You got to learn about the illness and you got to, you know, question the doctors and them too. They ain't oblivious. I mean, you know, they're not 
exempt from asking them a question about this disease. Right. Wow. Okay. Now, when did you finally find out that you had to start dialysis? Was it on an emergency basis or they kind of prepped you up and you knew? Well, I had I had a couple of good doctors, but I kept getting doctors that retired. So I always had to end up with another one. The last doctor I had who passed away and he ended up on dialysis too. Excellent doctor. Dr. Abu. And he was uh he worked with Dr. Wang. And Dr. Wang and him, thank God, when you have doctors that know each other and work together on your behalf is a great thing. So there's nothing wrong with linking your doctors if they don't know each other. So they were trying to really keep me off dialysis and stuff like that. I was getting the B12 shots because I kept being anemic. They didn't really say it was dialysis or I needed it then. So, you know, I had I had that. He Dr. Abu was my my nephrologist. So my, my and Dr. Wang was my uh, primary. So mm -hmm. once I found out, you know, it was it all started with those B12 shots and being anemic. It, it took a while before it came to that. I was like 41 when I got on dialysis. I heard about it when I was 30, 31, 32, when I was getting married. I got married at 32. So, you know, I didn't get on to like 10 years later that I got on dialysis. 10 mm -hmm. years. Later, you know, so, I, you know. And how did that process look like when you started? Did you? Uh, was it in a hospital or was it at an outpatient dialysis clinic? Well, um, once they told me um, that I had to go on dialysis, I, he told me that inside of the uh, the medical office. And I just kept shaking my head. I was on the train crying because I didn't have any babies and children yet. And I was like, how is this going to affect me? You know, this, that and the other. But I did start dialysis in the hospital. I started oh, yeah. it in the hospital. Yeah, while I was in there, they had gave me my fistula and they gave me um uh they gave me my fistula and I had a graft in my uh a catheter. In my, catheter, right. A catheter in my chest and I had the thing in the groin for the emergency, which was very painful. I'm sure Wait a minute. The so they put something in your groin, then they put something in your neck and then did uh access surgery. They did the access surgery and the um other thing together, but they had to give me dialysis first. They said that my blood and stuff was in bad shape and that they was giving me back to back treatment, but they said my body couldn't take anything else, that they had to give me the, the surgery to give me these things so they could go on with giving me the, you know, go on with giving right, me right. dialysis. Wow. Yeah. I'm sure it that was a cool. lot. Yeah, it was because I had to take so much in. But my husband was by my side. My siblings was by my side. D. Simone, Yolanda, you know, um, Mark had already passed away. But, it, you know, and my brother Joshua uh, Tardy, he was already gone. He had problems with the kidneys, but we never got a question as to why, because he had died at 35. My other two brothers died in their 40s. And my brother died on the machine. He was in his 40s that died on the machine. Name was Shelton Crossland. That was my brother also. Okay, my brother, so, so you said he Adam. passed away on the machine. He died on, he, yeah, well, yeah, because he, they had, he had um, bled out of his catheter. We were trying to get him not to keep that thing in his chest. And he, he was glad he didn't have needles and he didn't want his arm to look like our arm because my sister D. Simone arm was cut up. Trying so, to get it. Let me ask you this. Your brother that passed away and, and my condolences. Now, was this before you started or after you started? Well, we were all in the same center, all four of us. We're all dialysis patients in the same center. And he passed away. Matter of fact, I was home when he passed away because my sister called me. So none of us was in there when he died. We were all had our treatment already. He was there to get his. So how, if you don't mind me asking, did ahead, you ever man. find the, the circumstances behind that? Was that uh, was that operator error or, or patient error? No, that was a, a, a fault of the the dialysis center. And they said it, they were more 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 around the you know, it was they said it was new at the time that that started happening. But it was my brother's wasn't the only case. But in that center, yeah, it, he bled out in the center because the blood was under his chair. They tried to revive him and give him saline, but he had but how did he out. how did he bleed out? He should have been connected, right? Yeah, but it must have been loose because he had the catheter in his chest, but it the blood was everywhere. It it was under his seat, 
And it, they tried to hide it and stuff. My sister. Oh, my God. Yeah. My sister daughter went and got something out of the, the dumpster to prove. Now, I, I thought that was heroic and scary at the same time because they just, you know, they wouldn't tell us anything. They just kept saying he wasn't responsive and stuff like that. And we were all scared and upset. He had eight children that affect us to this day. Oh, my God. I'm so to sorry day. to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Me too. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Did, you did, see why this is so did, important? Did, did, exactly. Did they? Did you seek um, legal advice with that? You kidding? Okay. Sure, we did. It, it Great. took uh, some years, but they gave his children. You know, right, not that right. asked any any help, but it was a you know, it helped them per se financially. But it will never ever bring my brother. No, back. it would never. But that's why we we express and about being mindful of your treatment because i'm sure maybe at that time i don't know maybe your brother got on dialysis went to sleep and didn't notice that that was happening or felt the blood seeping down and it, i mean and then you would think as we talked the other night about the 30 minute checks technicians coming around and checking yes. patients vital signs looking at the patient checking and make sure that access is okay all the settings and correct so somebody messed up somebody i don't want to say the word i want to say uh the no, it's all right to say because if you don't say it i might throw it out there myself no Steve. but but somebody messed up here and not checking during that period when they were supposed to be checking and could have caught that and saved your brother so well, he was reading the paper you know he always came in he read the paper and everything and he said i feel lightheaded by the time he said he screamed that out where they could hear it enough to run over there that's what i was told so when they ran over there to save him you know there's no blood in the unit to give him blood back he already lost too much so they gave him you know they tried to revive him all kind of ways you know i believe resuscitation what have you but you know, giving him saline wasn't going to save his life if he lost so much blood. Yeah, wow. wow. The technician, the tech, the team got in a lot of trouble. I know the person had lost their job, and plus the, they had a nervous breakdown. I felt bad. They didn't want to tell us who it was because, you know, as an advocate, I know everybody, and I knew everybody in the center at the time, but we all left to go to another center. That's what I was about to ask you. Uh, Y'all didn't stay at that center. We didn't. Later on, I went there to minister there, but you know, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, we, we, we all had to leave the center. First of all, it was too traumatic to be there and go. Oh, absolutely. And they had to find one in the emergency. The only thing is, they were under the same. That was under the same people. You know, you learn that later. You know, in an emergency, you just go, and then you figure they were under the same people that he died under. But you know, such wow. is life. You know. So yeah, that was a trip. That was hard. That was very, very rough. You know, all I'm the sure. whole journey was is 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 rough. If it wasn't for God, I don't think I could do so much because I buried so many of my own warriors in my family. Right, right. And now, how did you, for warriors who's watching and hearing your story right now? I mean, we all warriors have different stories and deal with it in different ways. Yeah. How did you move past those dark times, especially? with you and your siblings going to dialysis at the same unit and for a traumatic incident to happen to one of your siblings mm. at a place that you trusted, you know, yes. um, how did you get past that to rebuild your trust at other facilities and know that, um, you know, this is, you know, the, what, what helped you move past to think that this is not going to happen to you? Well, I don't think I went to sleep anymore after that. Because sometimes, you know, for some reason, I don't know, as some, you know, I had different shifts in the dialysis centers. But, you know, at certain times you start to feel really tired or really sleepy. 
but I brought books with me, the Bible with me, and you know, my package and stuff with me. And since I was an advocate, I just stayed vigilant. I just didn't look out for myself. I sat up and looked out for others, but it took a lot of crying. It took a lot of praying and it took a lot of my siblings and I coming together, coming together, you know, to talk, to pray, to, cause it was hard for us to get, it took years for us to get past that. And it still shakes me up to this day. You know mm. what I mean? It still shake me up to this day. But, you know, if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be able to do it without prayer, you know, without fasting, without trusting God, without being vigilant and being more educated about this thing. So now when I see something, not only do I say something, I point stuff out. And sometimes they was angry. I say, OK, you know, you need to wash your hands with this or that one's uh, he looked like he's going to fall or, you know, um, whatever it is, serious or small. I was vigilant and I always co comment. Sometimes mm -hmm. they were welcomed it and sometimes they didn't. Oh, Lisa, we know what we're doing. Or who are you to tell us? Or don't say nothing or this and that. And I said, no, I got a right to say something. I say something. If I want to say something, I said, you want, you don't want me to call the Department of Health, do you? Because I knew the number and it stayed on the wall, you know, and I, I had it in the phone. So don't get us started. We can be make this a friendly fire or we can make it a blaze. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You know, so come on now. Wow. Wow. Now, um, after this incident with your brother, uh, was, was there ever a time when you was on the machine that you felt like that could happen to you? No, because my catheter was gone. I only had my catheter five months in my chest. I knew it had to go and I had to wait for my arm to mature. You know, my fistula, which is I still got that I don't need that still works. But yeah. Uh, I had to wait for that. So, uh, no, I really didn't feel that way. And I, I never heard my other siblings say that. Because we all shared our stories with each other. We all shared our pains. That was therapeutic for us, too. We mm -hmm. all talked about stuff together, whether it was that or any other thing that we were going through or what we, you know, what went through or what tech or what doctor. And, you know, we just talked. We kicked it a lot. We were a close family. So we, we kicked it about this and everything else. Mm -hmm. We stayed so, on each other's back about right. being right with our treatment. So, so what, 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 what was the actual time you you spent on dialysis? Twelve years, and well, I went on in February two thousand and four, and two thousand and sixteen, uh, June twenty ninth, I got my transplant. Okay, so yeah. what were you doing at the time? You got the call. Oh, I was working. I went to my job in Brooklyn and they called me while I was there. And I'm like, oh, my God, there's nobody in in the center for me to leave the center and go to go to the hospital. I said, just give me a few minutes. I'm coming. I'm coming. Mm -hmm. You know, and when I when my boss and them got there, it's like, oh, my God, you don't need to wait for us. Get out of here. Go on, pushing me out the door, shoving me out the door. So I took two trains to Mount Sinai. I was excited. I was texting on the train. Got a kidney. Got a kidney. I was taking pictures. Boom. In front of the hospital. I mean, I was just so excited. I was excited and, and, and happy and scared a little bit at the same time because my sister wasn't there with me and my husband who had passed away, who went through all of my operations and stuff with me. Most of my family all Excellent doctor. Mm -hmm. Wow. So. Now, do you know, uh, did you get a living donor or a deceased donor? It was a deceased donor. A young man had gave me his mother um, kidney who had a, a heart attack. She had passed away and he gave me um her kidney bless his life whoever you are bless your life i appreciate you wow yes i was able to write him a letter to, of thanks they allow you to do that so that was therapeutic and that was helpful just to know that he was going to get it even though they never let us meet or talk you know i was glad to be able to write a letter to show my gratitude my appreciation and everything to him and his family but oh, that was nice that was nice. Thank you. Now, um, let me just ask you, during your 12 years in dialysis, did you ever have any complications on the machine or experienced any that you could share with the guests? Sure, sure. I mean, with the audience? Yeah. Uh, when they started saying that um, we was um, about the low blood pressure, 
I started experiencing it there because that's where it started before it went outside of dialysis. It started there. And I had maybe three incidents where I had low blood pressure while I was still hooked up was one time. But I had one time my husband came to get me and I said, "Hun, he knows when I'm hungry or uh, I need to eat that I will get lightheaded or pass out or get sick. So between that and the low blood pressure together was really bad. So I told him, let's get out of here before they try to put me in a hospital for feeling this way. I'm hungry right now. Let's go. He said, while I was saying, let's go, when he turned around, I fell backwards into the chair. And they ran over there to me and started talking to me. And I can hear him talking. I can always hear him. I don't know. I guess because my husband and I had this connection. He kept saying, you know, don't die and don't leave me here by myself. You know, come on back. I love you and stuff. I heard him. But the, they kept saying, give a, um, they hooked me back up. I didn't want them to hook me back up. I'm talking to them, but they said they never heard me talking. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, oh, please don't stick me. They said, you got a sticker. I said, oh, God, no, don't stick me. Don't stick me. They stuck me. I felt that needle again. You know that 15-gauge needle, bam, right into my fiscula. And um, my husband said, uh, you must have said the word hospital. I see your eyes open because then he know I don't want to go to the hospital. He said, did you say the word hospital? Because I see your eyes starting to open. But they gave me fluid and stuff back. That would normally happen. <laughs> yeah, that would normally happen when some patients, when their blood pressure drops and it doesn't come up. And, you know, we say hospital, all of a sudden the eyes <laughs> pop open. Like, I ain't going to no hospital. I've seen yeah. that many times. <laughs> Boy, but I'm telling you, they used to give us broth, you know, the bullion cube yeah, broth. Yeah, chicken broth. Uh, right, course. and we used to feel better, but they had cut that out. I guess they got cheap. What happened with the chicken? The no, chicken you know what happened? You know why? Money? No, I, I mean, that's one, but the other reason is some patients... No, wait a minute, let me finish. Oh, I'm sorry. Some, some patients used to burn themselves. When they drank in that, it spills because it's real hot. Yeah. Oh, they yeah. never told us that. Well, why they didn't explain? They just took it away and said, no, y'all can't have that. No, we don't have any. I mean, no explanation. We thought we was being punished. No, but come on. We're talking about six more than 7,000 units. Everybody got their own explanation and reason. I'm just telling you why the oh. units where I worked at for the VA, why they got away from it because... Yes, it does help, but on the other side, when you give, see, when you have older patients and you got texts that that give that and walk away and do something else because they have other patients. Right, we ain't when you me. when you hold in that cup, some patients, you know, may be unsteady um, when they're trying to put it up to their mouth and drink it. They may yeah. still be lightheaded. Who knows? Oh, yeah. And, and if that stuff is hot and you shake it and it's kind of filled to the brim. Oh, yeah. It can spill. I mean, I've seen it many times. I've seen patients put it on the ledge of the uh, chair. You know, those tables that come oh, up yeah, on the they side. Oh, yeah. They're not stable. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, put it on there. They may, like, just move their arm and remember it that. It, not remember. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. You, now, see, look how you explained it. It took a nurse like you to say it after I'm off already. I ain't mad at you to tell me that that was the issue or the reason I could have bought that because I started buying my own and bringing it sometime. And it was hard to get the hot water from them or I had to bring a thermos with hot water. I mean, I, mean, I tried a little bit of everything to keep the pressure up. Well, I'm surprised you didn't do what, what a lot of patients do. Get uh, some mustard. Packet. No, mustard or... Uh, they use mustard for cramping. What? Uh, oh, wow. Wait till I tell my other sister. Get yeah, out of here. Salt and vinegar, potato chips. Doritos. It, it, I use the Doritos. Um, cool Ranch. I always brought that with me. That used to help right. me too. Yeah, and none of that stuff is any good. <laughs> no, but you know, it did help me because I it, you you're desperate. I, I didn't have dinner. I came in straight after work. So that made things a little rougher. You know what I'm saying? But well, but that's but 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 the 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 thing is, Lisa. Yes, sir. People are just treating the symptom. You're not treating the problem that caused the low blood pressure. Okay. So that being said, for a lot of people what caused the hypotension after treatment is 
too much fluid being poured off. Ah. Okay. Uh -huh. So if you got, if you under or you dehydrated because they took too much fluid off, eating Doritos or potato chips or even chicken broth is just going to help the symptoms. Temporary. Okay. Yeah. All it's going to do is make you feel better, pep you up, but you're still dehydrated and fluid depleted. Yes. And so that's why a lot of places when that happens that they want to recannulate or put the needle back in and Ooh, give you yeah. IV flu or normal saline, which is compatible to your fluids in your body. Ah, I like that. Teach, Steve. Teach now. No, but I, I, I'm just saying, see, a lot of, but see, what happens at the end of treatment when you're taking two or three people off and you're doing a changeover, a lot of techs don't want to deal with that because they got to keep it moving. And so what you may see if a person's pressure is low um, and the other patient is sitting outside waiting and it's a four hour patient right. or four and a half hour patient and this patient who just finished, if their pressure is low, they, they, they're not going to want to re-stick them in and put fluid in them. They're going to even want to put them to the side and have the nurse deal with them or try any type of trick just to get that uh, pressure up over a hundred when that person's standing. And even though your pressure could rise over a hundred, uh, you know, you see in that number, that doesn't mean that you feel good because your pressure is a hundred. It came from, you know, 90 to a hundred that you feel better. It, it just means your pressure went up, but yeah, yeah. you know, I see, I've seen this a lot, even with I patients mean, bleeding. You know, they move them to the side so they can get the other person on. And that person sitting over there still holding their sight for, for 30, 40 minutes. You ain't after never that lied. Treatment. Mm -hmm. Did that, any of that happen with you? Yeah. I mean, well, usually because I was always strong and upbeat, they didn't mind leaving me by myself or, you know, even um, being an advocate. They just felt, Lisa, you all right. Or Lisa, we just going to let me put somebody on. Sometimes they would ask and I say, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'm all right. I can do this while you do that or get the person on and out. They got accessorized or the ride is waiting or whatever. But there are times when you really don't want them to do that and you need that. And sometimes you have to voice that. But they had to look at me the way I look, because if I said repeated myself or I look one direction and I see the lights flickering, that's how I knew I was passing out. I always had to yell them to them about that. But they did um, cater to me or care for me. But when they couldn't, they didn't. Like you said, throw you to the side. So I've been mm -hmm. cared for and thrown to the side, too. So I've had it both ways, Steve. I did have it both ways. They used to say, I'm helping you by taking extra off. And I used to say, if I didn't gain that amount, don't take no extra. They said, but it's the weekend. I said, I'm already disciplined. I know how much to drink. Every time you take off too much, my husband have to carry me up a flight of steps or in our house. And I don't like that. I'm not a weak person. So if you took more off me by trying to help me, you, you damaging me and I don't like it. So I used to tell them that all the time. And that happens a lot, Lisa. And a lot of a lot of warriors don't don't realize that that the technicians or the nurse sometimes take it upon themselves to take That's off right. what they want to take off instead of asking the person what do they think. I mean, it's their body, shouldn't they know? Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes I didn't even gain anything. Or well, sometimes I was sweating because, you know, I was a jogger, a runner, a very active person. Even on dialysis, I was always active. And, uh, you know, like the, like it's hot now, I was sweating. Sometimes I wouldn't gain a thing. So I told them, don't try to take nothing off. They said, OK, we only going to take off what we gave you, you know, or whatever saline that we put in there or went through. We only going to take that. But sometimes they did sneaky stuff and I would cramp. So I would jump up. Wait, when you kids. say sneaky stuff, can you explain to us exactly what you mean by it? Because it shouldn't be nothing sneaky, sneaky. when yeah. you're dealing with your life. So can you explain uh, exactly what you mean by sneaky so other warriors can look sure. out and make sure nothing sneaky goes on with their treatment? Because I, I you shouldn't even have to be saying sneaky when you're dealing with someone's life. 
No, you shouldn't have to be saying it, but I'm saying it because they did it. Uh, I mean, like you said, taking off the fluid without the person knowing, that's sneaky. All right, that's sneaky. Knowing that you didn't change the gloves, knowing you came from another thing and you touched my machine and you know I'm going to go berserk, that's another sneaky. And I was, ah, ah, or, oh, oh, or get out, you know, or I would stand up. They always say, Lisa, you can't stand up while you're on the machine. Because when I'm upset or excited, I would stand, get right up out the chair straight up. I'll be forgetting that I was even on dialysis to say what I'm going to say sometime. I'm a reasonable patient, but I'm just saying when I was excited or they did something wrong, I would stand straight up and, you know, sometimes say something or voice my opinion. Not trying to be nasty or mean, but I needed them to take me serious. They don't take me serious unless I'm upset. Why would I have to go all the way there on the machine? Right, Especially right. since my pressure is 90 over 60, it became normal for my pressure to always to be 90 over 60, even when I was in that dialysis. And it you, developed. No, go ahead, Lisa. I'm sorry. No, it developed that way after so many years of starting to have the low blood pressure when I was there. Then it started spilling over to when I was outside or home because I passed out in the street. I passed out in church and stuff like that as well. So my pressure was low even then outside. But I'm just saying do you think um now you're an advocate and and you go around the different units yeah do you think that some technicians or nurses don't take patients seriously when they try to describe their care or what's going on with them well you know what steve i think i really think that sometimes they feel like because they're the professional and we're a patient or just a patient even though you're making your money from my illness, you you profiting off my sickness now. Long as you take care of me, I ain't mad at you. All right? But, yeah, some of them may talk over your head. Some of them talk to you like you're stupid or like you can't really understand or get it or they don't have time to explain it. Now, I didn't like that or I didn't like when that happened. I used to write everything down. I kept a book with me. So I, who put me on, who took me off? So I know you are not good at putting me on and taking me off. So I tested you and I tried you. I don't like it. So I would bar you from doing it. I would pick somebody else. But I would let everybody do it just to find out who. But if they didn't talk to me, I would voice my opinion about it or go over their head. I would say, okay, where's the... Uh, I always had numbers in my phone. So whoever was their boss, I had the number. If they didn't listen to me, I started taping. I tape stuff, tape people, especially when they didn't listen to me about somebody being sick or falling off the machine or something like that. I, they didn't listen to me. I thought that was disrespect, especially since not just because I'm the advocate, but because I'm a person with feelings, you are supposed to listen to me or try. I understand when you're busy and you overloaded and overwhelmed. When you like that, I don't even want you to. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. One thing you said, you said overloaded and overwhelmed. What, what do you mean by that? You seen text? Overwhelmed what? and overloaded. Get out of here. What? Running all over the place like they got roller skates on. You looking like this in the center. So when they're like that, you almost get a little nervous because you doing stuff too many things. I don't want you really touching me because then you might make a mistake. And mistakes have happened and I whispered it to them and said, you know, you forgot to give me this or you didn't do that. And they said, oh, thank you, Lisa. I could have blew it up and told it or try to be big Willie. Yeah, you know what she did? No. I told them to the side because sometimes you human, you might not know you did that or notice you did it. Like you said, trying to get them on and take them off like cattle. And let me ask you, by you looking on the outside in, because I know the reason why all that happens, but how do you view that the reason why you see this type of rushing and overwhelming? And what do you think from a patient perspective could be done to uh, make things safer for patient care? I, you know what I see? I see that they're being greedy by taking more of us when they don't have enough staff. That's one. And like you said, sometimes with the training being a little two weeks wasn't enough for the person. So they notice they're in this job now. You know, you either have to put up or shut up at this point, And you see some of them really couldn't handle it. Because they see in blood, they see in guts, people passing out tongue hanging to the side. That can be frightening. Sitting there and seeing somebody else die and pass out is a lot for me. I can imagine somebody working into this thing every day. But I think that they need to recognize when the person need a vacation. I know with my type of job, sometimes they used to say, 
you look like you need to take a minute or a break or let me handle this because you can see the overload. They need something like that or some kind of flow person in the middle when they see that you've done too much. Maybe you wouldn't have fell or maybe you wouldn't have, you know, maybe there would have been more help with your situation as well. But I'm just saying it just looked bad when you when they're doing too many things. They need to notice that with the work. See, as long as the person get it done, that's all they care about. But they don't see that the person is tired, overworked, overwhelmed. You know what I mean? I remember a lady, I think her son had passed away and she was at the unit. Her head wasn't straight. You know what I mean? You need to let her go home or let her out. You know, they're not recognizing what your needs are in order to give us our needs. Fix y'all first because you are dealing with us. Y'all the frontline workers. Fix the frontline workers so they can do their job effective and efficiently. If you don't do that, you're going to have things like my brother dying on a machine on your hands. Exactly, because there are staff out there that a lot of warriors don't know that work uh, five, six days a week, up to yeah. 13, 14 hours uh, a day, and then coming back the next morning only getting maybe three to four hours sleep and working on somebody, putting needles in. I've seen technician and nurses go out or travel and come back and, and only got one hour or two hours sleep working on people and then going back in the break room and sleeping on break. I, I mean, when you're in a position yeah. like that, yeah. there is a lot of room for mistakes. Honestly. And you don't have, there's no gray area when you're dealing with someone's life. Yes. And that's all where we try to preach the education and shows like yours and the other shows that we have on our network to have yes. patients just be mindful right. of what's going on in the center and, and know your rights know what uh, that is expected of you as a warrior and what your expectations are and rights from the facility. Right, right. Yeah, because I know? used to take them from the side and talk to them, Steve. I didn't embarrass them or hurt their feelings. I recognized they was either tired or sleepy or 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 slow. or Some of them sometimes was attitudish. I'm like that when I don't get any sleep. I don't make any sense. You know, and I, uh, you know, same thing if I'm on a diet or fasting, same thing. You know what I'm saying? So I, I recognize that and I would talk to them. I remember one tech told me, I'm not making up your chair. You make up your own chair. I'm tired. I told him, I don't know where, where you, I looked around like this and I'm like, no, you make up my chair. I'm not making up my chair. I just came from work. You get paid. I'm not making up no chair. I'm tired too. I'm looking to lay down when I get in here. And how you going to tell me? We went like head to head, toe to toe. And me and her are tight. So, you know, I tried not to be disrespectful or anything, but she kind of upset me and hurt my feelings at the same time. And I didn't like that. She could have came a, a different way with me. And she and, was the nurse. Right. And, and by you being now, one thing you just said, and I guess that's why they frown, frown upon uh, patient and staff relationships because sometimes it can go out of bounds. And for the fact that this nurse said to you, which was totally off guard to tell you to make up your own chair, whether she was playing or not. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, depending on how you look at that situation, she was wrong. And y'all shouldn't have to be button heads on who's going to clean that chair when it's her job because she gets paid for it, just like you said. Yeah. Regardless if you're tired or not, that's what you get paid for. That's what you put yourself in that position to do. So right. don't have or tell a patient that you clean your own chair, uh, whether you was playing or not. And, and those are where boundaries are crossed. And again, I can see why you know, companies frown on staff patient relationship, you know, being professional, but at the same time, that's kind of hard in itself because you see, you see a lot of patients more than you see your own families three days a week. Well, Steve, 
I had very good relationship. I mean, I can name names. I don't know how they feel about that, but I'm just saying I had a very good relationship to this day. I'm friends with a lot of uh, techs, a lot of um, nurses and even the doctors. One doctor said, Lisa, I want you to give this kidney stuff up. You sleep, drink and eat kidneys. And when you get that kidney, I don't want to ever see you come back here. I felt bad and upset at first, but then I understood because he knows I, I, I'm i strong about it and I run after it. He said, I want you to live your life. Relax. All you think about is this kidneys. I want to take a vacation. Leave it alone. He used to tell me that all the time. I don't want to see you when I, you know, and I, I didn't know whether to take that good or bad. I understood in a way he wanted me to stop being on my race, but who can stop? This is something that's ongoing. And as long as somebody can get something out of it, I, I can't stop. Like you, I'm riding to the wheels for a while. Sometimes I think my family gets sick of hearing it too, but right. they know I'm passionate about it and I just, I can't help it. But, Sorry. but you know, we all, and I'm starting to realize it as well. We all entitled to some type Time of relaxation myself. to ourselves we because we, we do are. have to take care of ourselves in True. order to continue to fight. Amen. Um, you know, so at what point did you start advocating for kidney disease? Was it after your transplant or during the time you were on dialysis? No, it was during the time I was on dialysis because I started seeing a lot as I started in my own center. And then I branched out to other centers and then I started going to meetings and joining groups, you know, like, you know, live. Getting actively involved. Yeah, because I kept seeing so much. That's what made me write my five books. That's what made me start Blessed Kidney Connections. That's what made me speak out and go out. And I decided not to just go to dialysis centers. I started going to, you know, the, the elderly places, the senior centers. I go everywhere, colleges, because some of these people don't know anything at all about us. And I'm like, get out of here. So I figure like if you can get the community involved, you can get it. You can spread it out in the neighborhoods better. Mm -hmm. And that's not always easy because I had to contact a lot of them, write to a lot of them, call a lot of them, email a lot of them. And some of them accepted it. Some of them rejected. Some didn't understand it. And then some had to come back and say somebody in my family is going through this. And then they, you know, they agree. But it have to take a, a, a half dead experience sometime to get anybody to look your direction when it comes to kidney awareness, disease or anything. Mm -hmm. Were you a social worker before you got on dialysis? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 23 years I've been a social worker with families and stuff. And, um, you know, even then, I embarked on people, a, a lady that was pregnant that had, was on dialysis, and I met a little boy that had one kidney. So his mother and them, she, she welcomed the, the help, even though sometimes my job, they didn't want it at first. You know, they don't want religion, and they didn't want anything about health. But then when they saw the people was getting uh, help with it, they started recognizing it because first they was downplaying it and trying to, you know, almost make you feel small about it. Or, you know, they never even put it on a program. So I started arguing. You got all these diseases on a program. No good and well, I'm dealing with uh, kidney disease and I don't see it up there. So they gave me a whole platform and let me speak. But I had to fight for it. Why well, I have to fight for it? You see, I went through hell with this. You know what I mean? Ain't no walk in the park. Right. You know, right. Wow. Trying to get people to dodge a bullet. If you can, if I like prevention and education is the key, then eat it and suck it up. But then once you on it, you can still live with it. But why would you want to go through all of that when you could have prevented it in the first place? Sometimes you could, not all the time. Sure, sure. Now, during, the, during those 12 years of dialysis, did you ever try home dialysis? No. They did present that to me in the transplant. I ran from both of those things. It's funny how I fight for it now and ran from it then. Um, well, home dialysis, I didn't want because I knew for one, I couldn't stick myself. I didn't like needles before I got the dialysis. And now I can only take them because the dialysis needle is so big to like to the thousandth power. But um, the home dialysis, I like socializing. I like being with people. And then I didn't want to take my husband through having a job and then having a job working with me at the house. He already took care of me as a husband. So I didn't need him to have a job, you know, making it more harder on him. Mm -hmm. You know, so I didn't want to do it at home, even though my two sisters did do it at home. They did in center and home. And I wow. watched them. They were excellent with it. Excellent at it. 
You know what I mean? I was like proud of them. But I'm a social butterfly. I need to be in a place. I need to go somewhere. I don't want everything gotcha. in the house. Gotcha. And I, and I think that's why a lot of uh, kidney patients may not do it at home because they can be social butterflies as well and want to be around, <laughs> you know, other people. I, mean, yeah. I, I think it takes a certain personality yeah. of a person to do dialysis at home and that there's other factors that that come into play with that as well yeah yeah so um but thank god that people had that option oh yeah to, to do it at home yes i did listen i did listen and take it in i didn't just say get out of here or no i uh i heard about the next stage i heard about um doing the um the dialysis you know with the big machines in your house you know, and everything. I heard about the peritoneal and everything. Um, I listened, though, because I had to know my options. I wanted to know them, whether I agreed with them or liked them. I wanted to know. So if I had to tell somebody else about it, I could. And if I ever changed my mind, I wouldn't know where to go. So I took the information anyway. So sure. I did do that. You know what I mean? And it did work well for my sisters, even though they went back to the centers after a while. Mm -hmm. One got an infection with the peritoneal. A really bad one. And the other one, I think her husband was exhausted with doing it at home. He had did it for four years with her at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know what I mean? So they did both either way in the center and out. And they were willing to do and try. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? One, she did the buttonhole method. They learned how to stick themselves. They did good and they got our family involved. That's one thing you must do is get your family involved. My whole family know about polycystic kidney disease, at least my siblings and their children and their grandchildren. I try to branch it out to cousins and stuff, but sometimes they get scared or girl, I don't want to hear it or child, please. And then sometimes they'll listen. Or if they mm -hmm. read my book or see one of the shows, they go, oh, my God, why didn't you tell me you was going through that? I didn't know. I said, what you thought I was talking about? Right. Can we just see um, your access that you used on dialysis? Sure. Bam. There it is right there. Whoop. And so what is that called? This is a fistula. Uh-huh. It still works, Steve. I never had really much problems with it. I think I got it cleaned about twice, three times the most in the 12 years, because so it you, always Can you works. come a little closer? Sure. I don't so, know, I can't tell. Okay, how you... right there. Right so, there? Okay. Right, now, if somebody was watching it, turn turn your arm around just a little. Like this? No, the other way. Oh, Toward, like this. Right there. Uh -huh. So if someone was looking and, and saw you on the street, and they <laughs> said, no, I'm just asking, if someone asked you, what are those bumps? What, what would they you do. say to them? Okay. They don't usually ask. They usually you can see their face. They look like they're going to run, cry or jump or scared. I don't know if they thought I was a, sometimes I say I'm not a dope fiend. Sometimes I just outreach say that. I said, that's my fistula you're looking at. Mm -hmm. I say, this is because of dialysis. And sometimes they'll say what? And then I'll say more. Or sometimes I give a little five second speech. Now, what if someone said, how did that happen? Because um, they may see patients on dialysis who don't have an uh, arm like that. And they may see your arm and wonder, how did your arm get the bumps and some other people's arms don't have bumps? And okay. where, where does that come from? I mean, I know where it comes from, but, but they don't know. I'm, I'm asking for people who's watching right now who may just started dialysis or haven't got a fistula yet, uh -huh. and they may see your arm and they may think that they may have the same thing happen to them. What could you tell them? Uh, how did that happen over the 12 years? Well, I would say to them, because I do talk to them about it. I would tell them that um, I wasn't educated when they first started sticking me. And I learned later that doctor told me, he said, Lisa, they shouldn't have been sticking you that way to make your arm this way, to, to, to be puffed up. Because sometimes they would stick you wrong and move the needle all the way around. That was always painful. And it's just, even though they were trying hard, they were killing us at the same time. At least me, I'm going to say. 
You know what I mean? So my arm started to look different little by little. And then after a while, it just got worse and worse. Mm -hmm. But because it worked, they didn't want to flatten it. And they kept telling me because of where it was connected at that they they didn't want to bother it. So they didn't want to straighten it out. At first, they thought they could flatten it so it can look like it used to look. But they can't flatten it. Yeah, but they didn't they didn't want to at the time when I did talk to them about it one time before. They're going to flatten it now. They just didn't do that because uh, they gave me a wrong medication and couldn't operate on me. And we never got back to another date for them to flatten it. But when I wanted flattened in the past and everything, they didn't they couldn't flatten it. That's what they said. But they said it was because of the way I was being stuck caused my arm to be like that. So I used to tell them, don't stick me like that. Or the, or the doctor told me to tell you to stick me over here. They said, because the lump is big, that's the easiest place for me to go. They would go there. That's what they yeah. said. Let me, um, oh. let me come in with a, a clinical point. Go on, Steve. Preach that <laughs> clinical point. Nah, um, Take me to church. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Lisa, and to a lot of warriors out there, what happens with the cause of these aneurysms is something called one sightitis, meaning technicians or nurses sticking you in the same area. Now, when you get stuck in one spot, technically, the next time they stick you, it's supposed to be two finger width apart from the last place they stuck you. Mm. And so... Each time they move up, it would be a new spot. Well, with a lot of warriors I've ran into in my career, they don't like to be stuck in new areas. If they tell you to stick here, you know, you have a lot of patients be like, I want you to stick me right here. Don't go nowhere else. And I've heard them say that. Yes, Steve, go ahead. You know, and so you, I mean, you got to pretty much do it unless you, you know, talk them and explain why you don't want them, you know, you don't want to go in the same area. And even after you do that, they still say, no, I don't, still don't want you to go in a new spot because it may be hard to, to cannulate. You got some techs that are uh, intimidated going to new areas, depending True. on the patient. If the patient got, uh, you know, maybe an attitude or personality where they may cut someone out because you stuck them the wrong way. It, it, yeah. it could be anything, but those bumps come from sticking in the same area. And when you do that, the area, the skin gets weak. And it's because thin. you got that high velocity of blood that's coming through, that arterial blood that's coming through that yeah. arm, it's mm. going to stretch uh, the, the skin area and cause those aneurysms. And that's where it comes from, sticking in the same area. You, you got to rotate your sights. I know I, it hurts. Yes. The new area hurts. But Say you, you got to rotate the area when you're being stuck on dialysis. And the reason why the doctor wants them, like, told you to go on the side, because if you go straight in some of them aneurysm, it can cause prolonged bleeding. Mm-hmm. And it may not stop bleeding. I've seen, I seen patients who had aneurysms and it's shiny and the skin is real thin. thin mm -hmm. And it can cause uh, infection as well. This, Thank God I, mean, I never had an infection. It can cause an access infection. It, this, is, this stuff is not to be played with. Say that. You know, Say that. Yeah, it, 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 it isn't. And I just hope through these shows and through um, our education that we can uh, educate people on dialysis and people going through the stages of kidney disease and even before hitting dialysis, just to know what to be prepared for yes. if and when this happens. Oh, yes. Steve, can I say this? Sure. When, um, when some of them uh, said, let this one stick you or let that one stick you, there was one beautiful male nurse that he stuck me right here. He was the only one that found this spot. Now, look, this spot's the only flat spot. He was the only one that found this spot that could stick me here. 
And he was the only one every time I would come, I would try to get him because he would stay away from the rest of it. And he, he found other spots. Some people, like you said, it, it's not always just us because I know we would say that sometimes it hurts so bad you want to go to the same spot. But I used to tell him to rotate it because the doctor told me and because I don't I, lungs. I want you to stick where you're supposed to. And some of them did find the sides, the bottom, the, you know, the top, the over here. But he found this spot. But the problem was nobody else knew this spot or could do it but him. And that was a shame. How are you going to have a place with all of those people who worked there? One person, the only one knew that spot or couldn't get it or could learn the technique of what he did. Right. I don't know. I don't know. Come on now. Share the education. Right, right, right. Now, I mean, you got to. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. why we do what we do. That's right, Steve. You know, um, wow. Now, how did the idea for the Lisa Baxter show come up? <laughs> uh, well, my husband, he used to film me because I wanted to, to talk to people. And sometimes it was hard getting around. And I figured, well, with the show, the show can go places that I couldn't go. You know what I mean? It, you know, after, you know, going all over, I would fly on a plane and everything, go places and speak and talk. So um, I said, well, sometimes people didn't want to let you in. And I know you witnessed people not, you know, understanding your 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 uh, your what you're trying to do. So I figured, well, I do a show about dialysis and transplant and take it from the patient point of view, the doctor point of view the family point of view and resources that I'm trying to help the person that's sick to help them out to deal with this. So that's how the Leaf the Baxter show got birth because I wanted to the people to understand what we're going through and how everybody seeing it in a different light. Cause the doctor doesn't see it the way we see it. The text, the social worker. So you notice on the show, I have all of the staff that deal with dialysis as well as outside staff and other illnesses and resources that can help that comes up along our way financially and educational wise and depression and all that. I have all type of resources on the show because of that. And that's why the show was birthed to help the patients to deal the clients and the warriors, as we call it, the kidney warriors to deal with this better. They have to see that they're not the only one going through this. So we tell our stories over and over again on different shows, different platforms. That's how the Lisa Baxter show was birthed. Oof. Wow. Wow. And what about the books? Tell us about your your books. I know you have five, um, but how did those come about? Well, my sec this is my second book, Melzi Take Takes Dialysis to Show and Tell. Because I learned that children are uh on dialysis too. And I, I've been trying to get them to let me into a unit that deal with kids since part of my ministry deals with youth and I have a youth prison ministry and what have you. So I wrote that book to, to help uh, children in school and preschool because I do a lot of presentations in preschool and teach children and, you know, singing, where's your kidneys right in here. So I, we had to go a child's point of view and a child's way to get them to understand it. Maybe they're not dealing with it, but maybe they have a parent or relative on dialysis. So that's how that book was birthed. And they're in uh, Amazon, Next Libria's, Barnes and Nobles. Through the Eyes of a Dialysis Patient was my first book. And the reason why I wrote this, this takes you uh, step by step about us being on the machine. Why they take our blood pressure? How do you feel? Or how I felt when I first saw all of those machines with blood, you know? So uh, I got a lot of good feedback from my books and from my company. Uh, um, this is also um, on booksbaby.com. I do donate the books. I don't just sell the books. I donate the books to different uh, agencies and places. Sometimes I get people say, I ain't no charity case. You don't have to, uh, uh, you know, break the price down for me. They don't want it for free. So I said, well, you got a dollar. Okay, here, here's the book for a dollar. I'll, mm -hmm. I, you know, because I don't want to offend them or make them feel bad. I want them to know the book is out there, whether you want it for free or whether you want it to pay for it or want it at a discount or just to see it on a nook or whatever. But the books, um, 
is just to help the patient to understand what they're dealing with, what they're going through, and the family member, because the family member really don't always get us at all. They don't right. get what we're going through, and they think we're crazy half the time. Sure, sure. So, Lisa, as we come down to the end, of, well, we went over the show time, but... We did? What time? Oh! <laughs> but, it, hey, you're still getting that information out there. What, what could you leave words of encouragement to kidney warriors watching this who just started dialysis um, or just just received a transplant or even waiting for a transplant. Wow. Being that you've been on dialysis 12 years, post-transplant about three years, um, what words of encouragement could you leave with our audience that may be in similar situation? Okay. To the dialysis patients, I would say to you, get involved. Get involved. You see these bracelets I wear. One is uh, PKD. One is uh, colon cancer because my husband died of colon cancer. And the other one is a, another kidney type thing. I say get involved because it doesn't just educate you. It, it births you into another family. The kidney family is a beautiful family because we all have each other's back. We we listen to each other's story. We know each other's story. And I say, I say this because dialysis is not always easy, but you can do it. You know, you can make it. You can make it. And sometimes, you know, you have other stuff in life going on. You know, I didn't think I'd be a widow, but I am. And uh, you other stuff just go on. I didn't think I'd be out on disability for a little minute because I have osteoporosis now, but I'm telling you this because you have us and I want you to use us, dialysis patients. Use us. Don't let us just be out here when you have some help and somebody to care and somebody to listen, okay? Because we really do. We really do. And sometimes we're too tired to do this. I'm in a lot of pain while I'm doing this show, but I wouldn't take anything from it. Now, if you're a transplant person, you hang in there because sometimes it can be a long wait before you get that kidney. If you feel that way, get on more than one list. Get on more than one list. And even once you have to take a lot of pills and stuff, you go through a whole lot of stuff with the pills sometimes. And then it'll be better or it'll be all right. And they even have support groups for everything, for the dialysis and for the transplant. And I say to the family member, be patient with that family member. You don't know what we go through. We go through a whole lot and it hurts sometimes when y'all we feel you don't care or that you're too busy, but just show some love to that person. And they that that's medicine right there. Just to, to, to listen and show some love. Take them somewhere, do something with them and don't treat them like a sick, sick or don't treat them like they're a pain in the neck or don't treat them like you you sorry they're alive or you got to take care of them because I'm sure they wiped your nose at some time or helped you in some kind of way. So show the love and return it right back. And this is coming from the, the, the heart and not my head. I, I love you. We all love you. And I thank you for this time and space. And that's to the family, to the transplant and to the warriors and to the workers out there. Get some rest, get some sleep. And thank you for the ones that's doing their job. God bless you, Lisa Baxter. Wow, Lisa. Thanks for that. Wow. Wow. Really, really emotional. And I know you're very passionate about what you're doing and really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule uh -huh. um, and coming on and sharing your journey. Um, I'm sure well, I you- I love you, Steve. I love to oh, meet thank you. you. Love and you everybody too. on here. <laughs> Yeah, and I know God has a lot more for you, uh, especially here on Urban Health Outreach Media. Definitely look forward to seeing your show tonight. Can you <laughs> share a little bit about what's going on your show tonight? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, tonight, Bill Bill Brazil is going to be on the show. I uh, met him at the Polycystic Kidney Walk. And I met him at the uh, National Kidney Walk and we became good friends. And we did a documentary together with uh, Gordon 
Mr. Gordon Skinner. So I'm glad to have him on the show. I've been chasing him for years and I finally got him. I mean, he he volunteers. He He's very passionate about this. He's also somebody with polycystic kidney disease as well. He's a nice person, a good friend. He's a family man and he he's just a good person. And you have to be uh, just don't miss the show. You're going to love it. You know, there are people out there that care and want to do so. Take a note from their book, too, and get involved and learn something. And just come on and take that journey with us tonight, okay? Yeah. And what time is your show, Lisa? It's 8 o'clock at night. It's, it's 30 minutes, so bring your little healthy snack and sit up close and just have a ball with us, please. Sure. Absolutely. All right, Lisa. I appreciate that. Again, Lisa, thanks for coming on. Right. Uh, we'll definitely see you tonight. At 8 to 8.30, the Lisa Baxter Show. Again, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Lisa Baxter for coming on. See you later, Lisa. Thanks again. All right. God bless. All Good right. Day. God bless you, too. Have a great evening. Stay hydrated and cool. All right. I'm going to try. I'm going to come get your air condition. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lisa. Talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. God bless. <laughs> yes. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in today to watch my Great interview with Lisa Baxter, the Lisa Baxter Show. Um, wherever you are, stay hydrated, stay cool. If you don't need to be out in this heat, stay in and tune in tonight and watch us for the Lisa Baxter Show from 8 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Urban Health Outreach Media. Until next time, stay blessed and encouraged. God bless you. And thank you for all your support. Peace.